The theme I would like to talk about because I think it would be helpful and I think it would be useful for our spiritual practice is the theme of forgiveness, asking forgiveness. And in a way that's what the word we use in English but it's not really it's not really about asking forgiveness, it's more about acknowledging fault. And the reason I wanted to talk about it, there's this list of 37 Bodhi Pakya Dhammas, qualities that lead to enlightenment, sometimes called the wings of awakening. In that list, there is four bases of success, is one of the it's a list of other lists, 37 altogether. So in that list you have Chanda, Virya, Chitta and Vimangsa. So Chanda is aspiration in our spiritual practice. We have quality of aspiration. Virya, energy. Viga, putting forth effort. Chitta is uh, applying the mind, as far as I understand, in certain ways to train it, purify it, cultivate it. Vimangsa, this is important and this is related to this subject, what I wanted to talk about. Vimangsa is a quality of reviewing what you've been doing and evaluating and ascertaining whether or not it's effective. And so this whole area of acknowledging fault actually plays a profoundly important role in correcting our faults. So a lot of modern people have a very complicated minds, myself included, where we have a strange combination of pride and arrogance and also not liking oneself. So the pride and the arrogance isn't built on self-love, it's built on something else. It just seems to be, it's almost like the more materialistic the world becomes, the more neurotic people become. So you have uh, proud, arrogant people who hate themselves. Possibly less so in traditional Asia, although as Asia becomes more and more materialistic, and more and more sensual, we do see this more and more. And so a lot of people don't want to look at their faults because they already hate themselves. And this is, this is an obstruction. They don't want to look inside because they don't want to find more reasons to hate themselves. And this is important to look at and it's important to be able to separate because looking at your faults truthfully with the intention of purifying your mind and training, uh, refining your behavior is an act of compassion and wisdom. And then the act of adding self-aversion to it, that's neurotic behavior that we add to it, which no one is asking us to. And so, if you avoid looking at faults, or avoid acknowledging mistakes, because you don't want to feel bad, we have work to do here. The point is that we, we look at mistakes that we made, we have compassion for the fact that we make mistakes because we're under the power of delusion and because of ignorance and that making mistakes is in fact inevitable and we understand that learning from the mistake is the way that we develop ourselves so that's just something about learning to look at faults in a healthy way which is very different to the fault finding mind which is like looking at faults in others and looking at faults in oneself with a judgmental and some energy of aversion behind it. So it's an area of spiritual practice which is incredibly important and people tend to be a bit clumsy. So okay, even if our minds are clumsy, all we do is we get in there and we train them and we become less clumsy. So we have to become aware of our faults. Then we have to develop compassion, not self-aversion, not judgment, and Arjun Chah says in spiritual practice we have to look at our own faults 95% compared to the 5% that we look at the faults of others. So I think most of us need to do a little bit of adjustment in that area. 
And, uh, but you don't look at your own faults with 95% of the time with self-aversion and hostility and with a kind of a sneer at yourself. It's not about a kind of a contemptuous sneering. It's about an objective, clear awareness that looks truthfully, honestly, with the intention to do better. And it's an act of compassion. And so when you go into those painful areas, don't then take the pain as a reason to reject yourself. You go into the pain with loving kindness and you literally have to talk to yourself. Okay, I'm looking at this stuff because I want to experience less pain. I want to make less mistakes. I want my life to be a benefit to myself and others. So I'm going to go and look at these faults and I'm going to reduce them slowly, diligently. And uh, so that and just in the area of being willing to look at one's faults and being willing to acknowledge mistakes humbly. Now humility is a beautiful quality. So humiliation isn't very nice when we feel humiliated. But humility is a beautiful quality. People enjoy being with humble people and people don't enjoy being with proud people. So there's nothing to fear in humility. It's beautiful. And, and humble people suffer less. I mean, if you're proud, you're always offended by something. But if you're humble, you can just shrug things off. It doesn't matter. Why should I be treated special all the time anyway? A, you actually suffer much less if you have a healthy sense of humility. And uh, probably have more friends. Another aspect to acknowledging fault is in the area of karma. Karma is a very complicated and difficult thing to understand in its refinement and complexity, but we can understand general themes, we can understand that it's a pervasive law within the conditioned world, conditioned phenomena, that we have to work with, and what we experience is largely the result of past actions. So a lot, much of what we experience in our life is a result of past good deeds, past unskillful deeds, and also neutral deeds. So the thing about karma is apparently every thought, every word, and every physical gesture is producing some karma. That's why it's so complex to understand. But what we need to understand, or what, what's helpful to understand, is that there is kusala, wholesome, and there is akusala, unwholesome, skillful, or unskillful. And then there is a neutral, the neutral karma. We don't have to worry about that so much. But when we know something produces unskillful karma, we really have to try not to do it. Because we've already acted unskillfully for thousands of lives and we already have a lot of karma to work through. And if we know that something produces skillful karma, uh, helpful karma, then we try to do it a lot. It's like pouring in clear water into some muddy water. You just keep pouring in more and more good stuff. And then if you do that, when various challenges in your life come up, you'll often find that someone helps you through them. That's the power of merit. It's not that you don't get obstructions, it's that people help you when you have them. But one of the things I wanted to say, something that Lord Buddha says about lessening the effects of negative karma. Something that we can do which lessens the effects of negative karma is acknowledge the fault. So it's, it's when we bring awareness to simply know that was unskillful. I don't know why and I can't explain why, but I trust the Buddha when he says it reduces the negative karma. There's something about applying that wholesome mental dhamma to the fact of that that will weaken the karmic consequence of any unskillful act. Thank goodness. The other thing which will lessen the negative consequence is a healthy sense of remorse. And this is an area where modern people, again, we're really challenged in this area. Like there is such a thing as a healthy sense of remorse or sense of conscience. And it's not mixed up with rejecting yourself or hating yourself. There's no self-flagellation, there's no guilt trip. It's just that feeling that you have when you made a mistake and you realize you hurt someone's feelings and you really didn't want to. But we all know that feeling. It's like, oh, I didn't mean to hurt their feelings. Oh, I wish I didn't say that. You know that feeling. It's very wholesome, actually. We learn from that feeling. That's the feeling that trains us. Be careful, don't do that again. So we have to be receptive to that wholesome sense of remorse. That's conscience. 
in Pali it's called Hiri and Otapa. So acknowledging that something was unskillful, feeling a healthy sense of remorse or conscience about it, then setting the intention to try not to do it again. So, and this is a wonderful thing about the fact that we live in a karmic system, is that there's always the next thing that you can do to make your situation better. It's not, we're not doomed. There is a way out. The Eightfold Path is a karmic path. It's about using the most refined karma karmic actions, right effort, right livelihood, right speech, right mindfulness, right samadhi. This is all karma. All of this produces karma, but it produces a very particular type of karma that leads to the state where you won't produce karma anymore. So it's the raft that you use, but you have to use karma. That's the rules of the game. That's how it works. The law of karma, and nobody escapes it. It's only the arahant's mind which isn't affected by karma, in as much as I don't suffer. But if you remember that uh, even Lord Buddha has Devadatta, his cousin trying to split his order, he's made so much merit, so much barami, he still has his cousin trying to wreck things. <laughs> you have him having a backache, there's the occasion where he couldn't get some water, the water was dirty, and, and it related to some karma that he'd made. And the most kind of shocking or striking example of <coughs> how even someone with enormous barami and merit can still receive the results of karma is Mahamogalana, who was beaten to death. His body was beaten to death at the end of his life. Extraordinary. Imagine this uh, most powerful, equal to the Buddha in psychic powers, Mahamogalana. That barami, that one incalculable period plus a hundred thousand eons of cultivating virtue, the merit couldn't protect him from the karma. The karma was that he had actually killed his mother and father in a past life. So it was such heavy karma that even as an arahant and even as a foremost disciple of the Buddha, he couldn't escape that karma. But you could see the way merit and barami affects the situation in as much as he has to receive that karma, but he receives it at the end of a long and successful life, having helped the Buddha to the maximum possible. But the point is, we have to work with karma and we have to get interested in ameliorating, pacifying some of the effects of the unskillful karmas that we've already made and get really serious about making pure karmas that will support us when the challenges that come our way come. And so just going back on that, acknowledging fault, a healthy sense of remorse, determining not to do it again, and coming back to those four bases of success in your mental training, being able to truthfully review with an objective mind, how's it going? So that's also with your meditation methods, with your chanting, with your various practices. We check to see, is this working? Am I doing it skillfully? Is it getting good results? Is my mind becoming more wholesome? But also in the area of our speech and our actions. Uh, what did we do that didn't work? What did we do that was a mistake? And that's an important part of the process towards enlightenment, of refining, purifying, developing. It's an active path. It's a karmic path. The Eightfold Path is a karmic path. We need to engage it. There's also the four great efforts. So this path is a path where we apply effort. And uh, so what the reason I'm bringing up here is in terms of obstructions to spiritual practice, it's possible that we might have knowingly or unknowingly, intentionally or unintentionally, made some karmic obstructions towards Buddhas. It's possible. Or at least Bodhisattvas when they were training to be Buddhas. Because if we do have countless lives since beginningless time, and some of these great beings were Bodhisattvas who later became Buddhas, it's possible that at some point we made a mistake. And it's possible that that mistake might slow down our liberation. So I just think it would be a really good idea now that we're here in Bodh Gaya, because I don't think there's any other place, well there isn't any other place that represents the Buddhas of the present, the Buddhas of the past and the Buddhas of the future in the way that this place does. And so I'd like to lead us in a ceremony tomorrow and I just wanted to give this talk as a preface to that ceremony, where we, although we can't see the mistakes we made, we can have a willingness to acknowledge fault and we can have the aspiration to make less mistakes 
And so the ceremony will go something like, by body, speech or mind, for whatever wrong actions I have committed towards the Buddhas of the past, present or future, knowingly or unknowingly, intentionally or unintentionally, may my acknowledgement of the fault be accepted, that in future there will be more restraint and care. And I do believe that if we do this seriously, some of the bad karma that we might have made will be lessened. So I'd like to give us that opportunity. Can I just ask how many people will be interested in, in participating in a asking forgiveness of all Buddhist ceremony? Basically every Yeah, I will lead, yeah. So also the Dhamma. It's possible, just look in, in the modern world, it's possible India is a amazing example of different world views that existing in the same place. So most Hindus believe that the Buddha is an emanation of Vishnu. They don't know anything about the Four Noble Truths, so the Eightfold Path. They don't pay much attention to his teachings. To actually have the view that the Buddha is an emanation of a worldly god is very bad karma in relationship to the kind of karma it makes to come in contact with Buddha Dhamma. Also the Islamic view that similar to the Hindu view that a creator god creates the world and uh, in the past obviously the Islamic faith has been quite violent and harmful to Buddhist practitioners but we don't know we don't know in the past in millions of past lives did we persecute Buddhists did we have did we live in a place where there was Buddhism where we had a view that was incorrect that we believed and where we criticized the teachings of Buddhas is possible. And so it's just important to be aware and open to the possibility that maybe, I would say even likely, we've at some point made some bad karma in relation to the teachings of Buddhas and Arahants. And I just think it would be really uh, skillful and efficient of us to take the opportunity to do the same thing and by body, speech and mind, whatever wrong action I have committed towards the Buddha Dhamma, knowingly or unknowingly, intentionally or unintentionally, <coughs> acknowledging the fault, setting the intention to be more careful. Similarly with Sangha, in a Sangha, we actually just had our recitation of the monk's rules, 227 rules, we did that just before we came down. And we, the beginning of that ceremony is confessing any offences that you made in the last two weeks. So that's acknowledging fault and confessing and setting the intention not to do again is a, a basic part of the monk's life. That's what we do once a fortnight and that's how we check how pure is my keeping of these rules. Also with our elders, there's certain times of the, of the year where we will ask forgiveness of our teachers, usually on their birthday. Uh, if we're entering the rains retreat, we will ask forgiveness of the senior monk in the monastery and take dependence on that monk, and also at the end of the rains retreat. So it's just in Buddhist monasticism, it is built into the into the program that we ask forgiveness of our teachers sometimes because even though we're practicing mindfulness and we have a high level of virtue, we are still affected by greed, hatred, and delusion and can make harmful karma in relationship to our teachers, even those teachers who we love and respect. So we just acknowledge it. And uh, in the past, when we were less virtuous and less mindful, it's possible that we made even more bad karma in relationship to our teachers or the Sangha members who weren't our teachers. So we might not have had any faith. So I just think we're in a really great place where we can wipe the slate clean as an act of compassion and loving kindness and as a way of producing a very pure, uh, potent karma to uh, increase our support to grow in Buddha Dhamma and reduce obstructions. So I'll lead that. Hopefully tomorrow we get a space right under the tree and I'll be able to lead that simple forgiveness ceremony. But I just wanted to give a bit of an overview of why we're doing it. And really important to understand it's not a guilt trip. There's n nothing to adding aversion to the self-view phenomena 
is kilesa, is unskillful, and nobody's saying that you should do that. So if you do do that, it needs to be recognized as an unskillful habit. And whenever the monk is suggesting that you ask forgiveness, they're not saying feel guilty and they're not saying hate yourself. If you do, that's something you're doing. You need to learn not to do it. Acknowledging fault, asking forgiveness, is an act of compassion, an act of loving kindness. That will help you if you know how to do it properly. So I offer that for your reflection. Something I'd like to add to that talk. Something that you can do in terms of acknowledging fault and asking forgiveness. I was being a bit firm just now about saying if you do have a self-aversion or a guilt habit that no one's asking you to do that and please try to learn not to do it and uh, that requires cultivating compassion and loving kindness something that you can do which is very helpful is to offer the forgiveness to yourself so if there is some kind of a grudge being held towards yourself about various things recognize that as kilesa recognize that as unwholesome you can say I know you Mara and you can say go away of course I made mistakes I'm deluded I have ignorance and I will continue to make mistakes but I'm going to try not to but whatever mistakes I made I forgive myself so that's an Im a very important part of the process is that you clear out the grudge and the, the, the stuff that can feed the guilt the heavy backlog whatever it is whatever you did when we ask forgiveness of the Buddha Dharma and the Sangha you can just imagine this huge avalanche of golden light or white light and lotuses falling on you and just imagine that you're forgiven and then forgive yourself as well if the Buddha and the Dharma Sangha forgives you you can forgive you as well and you know challenge the self view who are you to hold a grudge against yourself it's all delusion you're not a self anyway get in there and challenge it so don't make it more solid by adding a version to it or getting fixed negative perceptions about it it's a way of perceiving things which is incorrect when we go through the Anattalakana Sutta the Sutra on Not Self in Varanasi in a couple of weeks we'll be going through that there's nothing in the five khandhas which is a self we grasp at them deludedly thinking it is but it isn't so apply your wisdom apply your mindfulness, apply your compassion, apply your loving kindness and whatever negativity is in there directed at yourself or others let it go <laughs> I decided to include the words of the actual ceremony which will begin in a few moments uh, feel free to listen or not Obviously there is quite a bit of background noise. Please repeat after me. By body, speech or mind, for whatever wrong action I may have committed towards the Buddha, Buddhas of the past, Buddhas of the present, or Buddhas of the future. Intentionally or unintentionally, knowingly or unknowingly, may my acknowledgement of fault be accepted now, so that in the future I may take more care and be more restrained in my relationship with Buddhas and bow by body switch your mind for whatever wrong action I may have committed towards the Holy Buddha Dhamma knowingly or unknowingly intentionally or unintentionally 
May my acknowledgement of folk now be accepted so that in the future I may take more care and be more restrained in my relationship with the Holy Buddha Dhamma. Bow. My body, speech, or mind, for whatever wrong action I may have committed to the venerable members of the Sangha, knowingly or unknowingly, intentionally or unintentionally, members of the Sangha of the past, members of the Sangha of the present, or future members of Sangha, May my acknowledgement of faults be accepted so that in the future I may take more care and be more restrained in my relationship with the Sangha. Bow. Lord Buddha, we understand that being still affected by ignorance and delusion, it is inevitable that we will make mistakes. We also understand that by acknowledging faults and learning from our mistakes, that we will grow in Buddha Dhamma and eventually be liberated from ignorance and delusion. May the Buddhas of the past, present and future forgive us for any transgressions and bestow on us all blessings so that in the future we may receive every support for the practice of Buddha Dhamma until complete realization and complete cessation of every type of suffering. And just imagine in your mind now that Lord Buddha, Buddhas of the past, Buddhas of the present, Buddhas of the future, have no ill will, have no grudge, in fact don't even perceive of themselves as selves or us as selves. They understand the ultimate nature of emptiness, abide in the ultimate nature of emptiness, so understand that all has been forgiven, they accept your forgiveness as a skillful means, a way to help us to lessen our negative karma and increase our positive merits. So just understand that all is forgiven, the past is the past. Anicca vata sankhara upata vaya dhammino upajitava nirujanti te sang upasamo sukho. The stealing of formations is bliss. Now turning inwardly along the theme of acknowledging faults and also along the theme of offering forgiveness. You could try to take a few moments to forgive yourself for whatever wrong action, a body, speech or mind I have committed which has left me with feelings of remorse, discomfort, ill at ease. I compassionately acknowledge that this is a result of ignorance and delusion. I offer forgiveness towards myself for these past actions. And I make commitment to lovingly, compassionately take care of myself, to learn from my mistakes and continue to train myself according to Buddha Dhamma. And not holding grudges against myself or others. Similarly, with any Sangha members, understanding that true members of the Sangha, people who practice mindfulness and wisdom, concentration, don't hold on to grudges. Understand that you are completely forgiven. And simply setting the aspiration to be careful. And due to this merit, May we always come in contact with wise masters, realized masters, 
true teachings of Buddha Dhamma, genuine members of Sangha, may we always come in contact with wholesome, virtuous spiritual communities who practice correctly. And just taking a few minutes to meditate quietly now, contemplating this theme of acknowledging faults, feeling remorse, a healthy sense of remorse, setting the aspiration to be more careful as an act of compassion towards oneself and others, and then also understanding that the past is actually completely gone, and we can let go of any remorse or feelings of guilt or self-aversion, completely let that go, allowing the mind to feel blessed by the boundless loving kindness, compassion, enormous merit of all the Buddhas, past, present and future. Imagine that their blessing completely encompasses your mind stream, attracting more and more helpful auspicious circumstances in the future. We just meditate quietly together now.